Hi there, everyone. Welcome to your very first video lecture for AP Human Geography. My name is Mr. Lewis, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm going to be doing the lectures here for Units 1 and 2 of this course. Uh, unit 1 is an introduction to geography as a whole, as you can see in the title right there. And we're going to be laying the groundwork for everything else that's going to come this year. So, so what we do in Unit 1 is very important. It's, it's um, laying a foundation to be successful, not just in the school year in class, but also on the AP exam in May. So, Unit 1 is an introduction to geography. Unit 1.1, Section 1.1, which is what I'm going to talk about in this video, is an introduction to mapping. Mapping is extremely important for geographers. It's extremely important that uh, you have some mapping skills, not just um, creating maps, but more importantly, reading maps and being able to interpret maps. So that's what we're going to discuss today, and it's going to be really uh, crucial to your success in this class that you are able to read and interpret these maps properly. So without further ado, let's get into it. So section 1.1 is titled Introduction to Maps, and maps are a crucial tool for all geographers, and we're going to make plenty of use of maps in this course. And the question that's listed is, what can maps tell us? And the answer is quite a bit, but sometimes maps are actually giving us information that might not be entirely accurate. If you look at this map, there's a couple things that are a little bit off. And we're going to look at this map a little closer uh, in a second here. But, but if you pan from left to right and from north to south, just try to notice one or two things that might look a little bit off to you. Now, in class, we watched a video that actually highlights some of these issues. It's from a show called The West Wing, and it was on some years ago, and, and many of you probably wouldn't recognize it at this point, but there's a great scene where they're showing different projections of the world to people who work in the White House. And they're shocked at what they're seeing because the world is different than what they had been imagining it was their entire lives. And you're going to see how that could be possible. But just a couple examples here. Look at the size of Greenland. Greenland is uh, by no means a small country. It is a large piece of land. But it is also by no means about the same size as the entire continent of Africa. That's just inaccurate. And when you look at the size of Alaska compared to the contiguous United States, it is certainly large, but, but is it as large as it's making it appear on this map? Uh, another question, where's Antarctica? So sometimes maps aren't 100% accurate. Uh, in fact, you can see that Alaska is not nearly one half of the entire mainland United States. Um, it might be about a fifth looking at this map. We'd have to look at square mileage and things like that. And it is certainly large. You can see it takes over uh, all of Indiana and the rest of the Midwest here. But sometimes maps aren't exactly accurate. And there's a reason for that. Now, we're going to come back and blow your mind a little bit more here in a moment. But a little bit of history first. There was a person named Eratosthenes. And, and he's considered to be the uh, father of modern geography. He was the, the first scholar. He was a Greek scholar. The first scholar to use the word geography, the study of the earth. And basically, geography in our minds, our, our definition, is the study of where things are located on Earth's surface and why. When we add in the human element, that's where this class really becomes unique. And what makes it different than just a regular geography course where you're memorizing where mountains are and lakes and oceans and countries, we go a, a step further than that. We ask ourselves two questions. One, where are people and activities found on Earth? because they are concentrated in particular areas and have different particular uh, activities located in those specific areas. The second question is, why are they there? So where are they and what activities are they doing, but also why? How does the world shape human activity? Mapping is crucial to this. It helps us think spatially, left to right, up and down, parallels and, and uh, uh, meridians, um, uh, the equator versus the prime meridian. All of those things help geographers both display and analyze information. Okay, maps can serve really two purposes. One, 
a reference tool. They help us to locate and identify things. You probably do this all the time when you're traveling either on your own or with your, your family or friends. It also serves as a communication tool. A map can depict information about a location and that's really what's more important. Anybody can just look at a map and say, okay, Illinois is left of Indiana. But not everybody can take all the bits of information away from a map that it's really trying to to give to us. And, and by the end of this course, you're going to be really good at doing that. Map making. There is actually a science of making maps and it's called cartography. Some of you could get into this one day if you like. That's still very much a, a study um, that people go into and, and map making is very crucial. Uh, now it's done in, in more of a um, digital techie sort of way. We, we go more in depth with the, uh, the technology we have out there in, in 2020. But map making is still very alive, and, and the earliest maps go back uh, over 8,000 years, really, to uh, uh, roughly 6200 BCE. And you can see that map here, okay? Here's the map itself, and, and it's very clear to see these are, uh, this is some type of organization. These are structures in, in some type of pattern. Here's a three-dimensional layout of what that town may have looked like today. So people were trying to do this from a very, very uh, early point in history, and you can understand why. Maps can give us all kinds of, of useful information. The problem with maps is that we're trying to take a round object, and yes, the Earth is round, despite what other people might want to tell you. The Earth is a round object. So now that we got that out of the way, when you're trying to take a round object and make it flat, problems occur. Imagine taking a baseball and taking the stitches out of that baseball. That baseball is not going to suddenly be able to take its outer layer and lay flat into one rectangle. Doesn't really work like that. Okay, if you've taken geometry, you know that. But because of that, we have some issues as geographers. We get different distortions because these projections of a round object onto a flat map distort the images or really what we're thinking about is the land and the water uh, and the distances between things on those images. So the major issue is called distortion. There are different types of distortion. It could just change the shape of an area, okay? And we see that all the time. And that's really hard to keep from happening because when we're talking about the borders of a country, they're so specific that to uh, take a round shape and to make it flat would certainly alter that shape. Uh, the distance between two points may seem more or less because of that distortion. There's relative size distortion of different areas. And then also, there's direction distortion. So uh, the, the actual direction, meaning north, northeast, northwest, can be altered because of that distortion. You may think something is directly east of you, but really you kind of have to go southeast. So maps can uh, uh, lie to us a little bit. Now, there's different projections that people have come up with over the years to try and give us the best image of what the Earth actually looks like on a flat surface. The Winkle projection, you can see, keeps the north and south flat, but the outer edges are rounded. So what ends up happening is you have these meridians, the lines that are going from the North Pole all the way down to the South Pole, that become more and more bowed out as we move left or right. Okay, and then you have parallels that, again, are, are a little bowed because of the nature of the Earth. And then the equator is right in the middle here. So, that's the Winkle projection. We also have the Mercator projection, which keeps a perfectly uh, rectangular shape here. Antarctica looks awful big. Um, once again, another issue. Greenland looks pretty large in comparison to, say, South America or Africa. Uh, and we know that that's not accurate. So the Mercator projection, not so great. It also has, though, these lines of longitude and latitude, or uh, meridians and parallels. Okay, all these maps are going to have those. The Gall-Peters projection is uh, one of the more accurate, actually, systems here that we have. And you can see, again, a grid system. It's in a rectangular shape, but there's not as much distortion as there is in the Mercator projection. And then finally, the good homo homolazine 
uh, projection is uh, basically what we were talking about with the baseball. If you took something like a baseball and, and you tried to flatten out that round surface, you took the, the outer layer off of a round object and tried to flatten it out, you would end up having to tear along the side to get it to go flat, right? We would have to do that. And that's kind of what this projection is representing. There would be these splits in the earth. We would have to tear away to get it to lay flat, its outer layer. And, and, and that's what we see here. So it's, it's trying to be as accurate as possible. You can see the red line here is our equator. And we still have all of our lines, our, our parallels and our, our meridians coming north to south. So uh, all of those things are still there. There's just some gaps in the world. But if you were to take this and wrap it around something, it would fit like a circle or a sphere. Interpreting maps. So now that we know about distortion and to look out for distortion, I mentioned these meridians and parallels, right? These meridians and parallels are what help us locate something. If we were to look at this map and I said, all right, where is this point right here? It looks like it might be in the state of Washington, perhaps, but there's an easier way to say that. If we have all of these reference points, these lines, we can use those lines to identify individual points from this point that I'm circling right here to Crown Point High School. That's what we call latitude and longitude, and that's what meridians and parallels are used for. Meridians connect the North and South Pole, so they go here all the way down here. That's a meridian, and we can measure left and right. So meridians actually help us measure east and west because let's say we're starting at this meridian, this line all the way here on the left. As we move to the right, we're moving along different meridians there, okay? Even though the equator is a left to right line, the equator is a parallel and parallels, depending on where they are, move north or south. So that gets a little confusing for people sometimes. Meridians run north to south. Parallels run east to west. They're like circles drawn around the globe. And just remember the equator is a parallel. The equator is a line of latitude. Meridians are longitude. Okay, so sometimes that gets a little confusing for people. It's something you're going to have to commit to memory uh, I remember thinking about it as latitude runs left to right, okay? Latitude, it's moving laterally. They run left to right. Longitude are long pieces going north to south here, okay? So we're going to have to uh, work on that a little bit, and we will as the year goes on. The prime meridian is zero degrees longitude. So that's like the middle line. That's the middle meridian. It is the equivalent of the equator. The prime meridian is the longitude equivalent of the equator. The equator is zero degrees latitude. And as you know, it tends to be pretty hot around the equator. Uh, very, very tropical temperatures, uh, equatorial climate, as they call it. And here's another diagram. I think this is very helpful to help you see the different lines of latitude around the world as we move north to south all the way down to Antarctica. Uh, and then the lines of longitude. This would be the prime meridian right in the middle, and we're moving east or west of that line. All right, finally, last bit here for today, different types of maps. So we have different types of distortion but then there are actually different types of maps because distortion is just the size or distance or uh, relative size of, of, uh, or shape of different countries. There are different types of maps, though, that communicate different types of information to us. One is called an isoline map, two, choropleth, three, graduated symbol, four, dot distribution, and five is called cartogram. And instead of explaining each of them, I'm going to show them to you. So for each map, we're looking at corn growing, which I know is, is a really exciting statistic for all of you. Uh, I find it exciting as well. So corn 
grows really well in Indiana, as you know. We're very good at doing that. It's actually something that we should be very proud of. You can see on this map, this is called an ISO line map, the dark green areas that are outlined here are the major corn growing areas. Just outside of that, you have this light green area that's minor corn growing areas. So what an ISO line map does, it actually isolates specific areas by drawing a line around those areas. And notice, it's not paying attention to borders. This line is running over and through different borders. It's not concerned with those state borders. It's just concerned about the areas that are major corn growing areas. And then everything in gray would be, uh, wouldn't fall into either of those categories. So the question is, if this is how an ISO line map shows this information to us, how would a different type of map, one of the other four types, show us the same information but communicate it in a different way? A choropleth map does this. It keeps things a little cleaner in the sense that these state borders are respected, right? They're not just moving across state borders and drawing lines. Each state is filled in with a specific color that coordinates with this map key down here. This is corn production in bushels. So if we wanted to know how much does Indiana produce, we'd go to Indiana, find it, there it is. It's that lighter green color Go down here, match up with that color, and we would answer Indiana produces somewhere between 100 million and we'll just call it just under a billion with a B bushels of corn each year. The top two states that are in this darkest green color above 2 billion bushels, that's a lot of bushels of corn, are Illinois and Iowa. They're kind of the corn kings of the the United States and the world. All right, dot distribution map. So, same information. We're looking at corn production. It's nothing fancy, okay? Dot distribution is gonna take one individual dot, each dot, and it represents 100,000 bushels of corn. So they're gonna take each individual dot and plot it in an area where there's that much corn production. Now, as you can see, in a state like Montana, this big one up here, you can actually see the individual dots. We can actually identify those individual dots. But in states that are major corn producers, like Illinois, Iowa, you can see that this state is essentially a big blur. Right? There are so many dots because there are so many 100,000 bushels of corn. It's well beyond that. We were, we were talking about billions that the state is just filled in with green. You can't even make out those individual dots. So you can tell by how concentrated the dots are where the major corn producing areas are. And, and what you'll notice is that this map is not all that different from this map. Look at where the dark green is here on our isoline map. And if you go to the dot distribution, it's kind of the same thing. The same pattern arises, but it's communicating this in a different way. The fourth map is called a graduated symbol. It's taking a symbol. It doesn't have to be a circle. Okay, it could be anything. And it's showing how that map is graduated or increased, enlarged, okay, enlarged, excuse me, uh, as the uh, corn production increases in that area. So again, Illinois and Iowa have these giant circles, these giant symbols, because they've been graduated to that 2 billion marker, whereas a state like Texas is probably somewhere between 100 million and 500 million, right? It, the size of this circle falls somewhere between these two. And then California, very small under 100 million. So that's how we use a graduated symbol map. And then finally, a cartogram map. This is one is my favorite, you guys. So this is showing you a map where the geographic area of that state is actually enlarged to represent more production of corn. So in this version of the world, in this version of the United States, Illinois and Iowa are the biggest states in the country and Texas and California are pretty small. 
Montana, tiny. So Indiana in this case, hey, we're, we're looking pretty good. Uh, the Midwest in general, I Illinois, Iowa, uh, Nebraska, Minnesota, very big states now, whereas the East Coast, very small. The South, very small. The West, very small. So that's what we call a cartogram map. So those are your five different types of maps. And what I'm going to do at this point is direct you to your types of maps challenge. That is the assignment, the graded activity that goes with these different types of maps and section 1.1 to make sure that you understand this and that you can find these maps and pick apart the information that different sorts of maps are communicating to us. It's an important skill. We want to make sure that you uh, master this skill. So after you're done watching this video, go directly to this types of maps challenge and watch the video, read the instructions and uh, complete that when you can. Everyone, that's it for section 1.1, your introduction to mapping. Uh, it's a very important skill that we're going to be using for the rest of the school year and, and uh, also definitely it'll come up on the AP exam. On the unit one test, expect those five different types of maps to come up. We're going to have a few different questions about those, not just what type of map is this, but also you're going to have to be able to extract information from different maps that we give you on the test. So take this activity, the types of maps challenge very seriously and know that you are essentially preparing for what you're going to have to do on that unit one test. And of course, with any test, we're going to have a practice test before that. So you'll see what types of questions might come up. All right. When you go into that types of maps uh, challenge, please make sure that you complete the entire thing, read all the instructions, and then share your document with your teacher and then submit it in the Dropbox on Buzz properly. That's all we ask. If you have any confusion about that, you can watch our instructional videos that are located in Buzz or just reach out to one of us with your question. Thanks, guys. See you next time.